Welcome, everyone. Yep. We have Hi. a few more people come in. <laughs> Welcome. Yep, come on up. There are still some seats a little bit. Oh, good. We got our Elwood. Awesome. Yay. Yay. Wait, I'm being bad about being quiet. Shoot. <laughs> Violet oh. doesn't talk in these games. All right. Well, it's kind of doing three hopes, but we're, we're, we're not going to talk too much about three hopes today, <laughs> but... Oh, welcome everyone. Dear do it. And no dear is one dear. All right. So, uh, welcome to Emerald Emblem, uh, the Fire Emblem. Yeah, Irish mythology's influence on Fire Emblem. I am Octavia Hayes, a research librarian and mythology nerd who saw a few things, uh, who had been interested in seeing the progression of how Irish mythology goes through the Fire Emblem series. So, a quick show of hands. How many of you have played a Fire Emblem game before? <laughs> all right, good. <laughs> so we've got that ground covered. Uh, all right, so we've got three big games that we're going to be focusing on. Good point. Well, that was the first one. Uh, how many of you have played Genealogy of the Holy War? All right, we actually got a couple in here. Awesome. All right, how about, Thra how about Thracia 776? All right, still a couple. How about three houses? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, so. To start us off, oh, can you turn on my uh, yeah. clicker? Perfect. So before we begin, we do have a few content warnings on mythology and the games coming up. Some of the myths that we're going to be looking at today do feature death, dismemberment, and disembowelment in particular. And so like, if any of these are like disturbing or fine, like, please be, feel free to leave. We won't be disappointed. As for the games themselves, the plots involving human sacrifice, child endangerment, death, burnings, and incest, mostly from genealogy, but it's, it's a Fire Emblem game. They're going to, it's going to pop up somewhere. And then, of course, spoiler warnings for the endings of Genealogy of the Holy War and, three ha and most of the endings of Three Houses. All right. So, some notes on pronunciation before we start. Oop, oh no! Okay. Yeah, the scroll wheel. There yeah. we go. Okay. So, Irish Gaelic or Gaelga has three dialects. You have the Munster dialect, which is spoken in the south, the Connacht dialect, which is spoken mostly in the west, and the Ulster di dialect, which is spoken up in the north near Donegal and Northern Ireland. I tend toward the Connacht dialect. That was the one I was taught on. I'm still not amazing at it, and but we will go through this as well as I can. And my tendency toward Connacht is going to be amusing, to say the least, in the, about hopefully 30 minutes. Lastly, Irish pronunciation is very difficult. The three dialects usually mix in some way that there's, there's some overlap, not a whole lot. Sometimes I will just get something completely wrong on top of that because I am still somewhat used to getting to talking in it, but not entirely. I'm going to, so I'm going to try my best and show you guys, and hopefully do better than, a lot of, than some of the translations do. On that note, of the three games we're going to be talking about today, Only Three Houses has been translated in full. Ge genealogy remake when, but... <laughs> but yes. So some of Genealogy and Thracia are only translated through Fire Emblem Heroes right now, and the Heroes translations can be kind of a mixed bag sometimes, because sometimes you get good ones where they are like staying relatively true to what the character was supposed to be. Other times, less so. Yeah, so Oife, a quick note on Oife here. It's meant to be Aoife. A O I F E, and so it's a name. Like it, it's already a somewhat difficult name to pronounce. But when they went with it, they didn't put the A in due to how like, it would pronounce in Japanese, and it has just turned inexorably into Oife, and it has annoyed me for the last ten years. <laughs> All right, so. Quick overview of the Irish mythological cycles. There's there are four major ones. There are a few other minor ones that are 
sort of individual subsections, but for our purposes today, we'll be looking at the mythological cycle, the Ulster cycle, the Fenian cycle, and a tiny bit of the King cycle. Mo and, but that said, most of these weren't written down until post-Christianization in Ireland, d d given that it was about fourth century CE, and so things can get a little bit strange at times in regards to chronology, whether or not the Tuatha de Danann are actually gods or not, any other sorts of retcons that happen in, in different stories. So we're just going to have to work with what we've got, because what we've got are some sources. That said, we do have a fair number. With the mythological cycle, I'm going to be working primarily with Le Borgia Bala Aaron, which is the Book of the Taking of Ireland, or the Book of Invasions, as well as the tale of Medir and Edain, which is going to be an interesting one to talk about. These focus largely on medieval prehistory, or mythical prehistory, not medieval prehistory, the gods and humanity's place in the world. For the Ulster Cycle, we've got a few more, like a few more, there's a lot more to the Ulster Cycle, but I chose to sort of focus in on these three, the Cattle Raid of Cooley, the Wooing of Emmer, and the Death of Cucullin. These focus primarily on the hero Cucullin. He is the major character in all three of these stories, and his defense of Ulster from the conquering Queen Maeve. Lastly, we have the Fenian Cycle, where we're going to be talking about some boyhood deeds of Finn, Finn and Grania, and the pursuit of Diarmuid and Grania. And these focus mostly on looser individual adventures of the Fianna, a group of nomad hunters and heroes, and their leader, Finn McCool, with the like, just best name to say. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, the King Cycle is largely names and lineages of kings. It's largely just tale, like a few tales of how rulers should act and how they should operate. It was largely just bards would tell it in order to list out the lineages of the king that they worked for. We do, however, get a little bit more information on Geisha, which we'll get to when we get to, to Thracia. But starting off, we're going to start with the first game in the series that sort of really dug into Irish mythology. With, gene with Genealogy of the Holy War. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Died in a fire! <laughs> <laughs> Spo Don't worry, we did announce spoilers. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I didn't put... I did not put content warning barbecues, but I was tempted. <laughs> but where the Arcanea games mostly focused on the on more Greek, mytho Greek and Roman references, genealogy went hard into Irish and Norse. And whoop. For example, this is a list of the just playable characters in the game who have names referencing Irish mythology. There's a lot. There are even more in the NPCs and in the location names and in the and in bosses, I know there's at least one more again in the bosses. One of the heroes relics is Gay Bolga. But the thing about most of these names is that not a lot of them have much to do with the myths themselves. At times, like you might get close in one place, uh, in the middle bottom of the middle row, you have Yukar and Yukarba who are brothers in the game and brothers in mythology as well. But they had a third brother that sort of kind of gets ignored through all of this, unfortunately. Our top of the name list there, Brigid, is a archer and a pirate in the story, but the mythological Brigid is a healer and a healer, a smith and a poet. So like you don't really get as much of the like interconnectedness that you would hope to see with a lot of these. In particular note, in particular note is the story of Skahak and Larsa, who were had a bit of a thorny translation journey as time has gone on. So the two characters are twins in the second generation of Genealogy of the Holy War. 
Their original names in Japanese were Rakuche from Lukta from Luktain, and oh boy, I've tried, I've practiced this so many times. Let's give it a go. Uh, Sakasaka from Sakasher from Skaha. In the original myths, uh, Luktain was a man. He was the he was one of the crafters of the Tuaha de Nanan. And Skahak was a rather famous warrior woman. If you've seen any other... Like, the name comes up a fair amount in fantasy games. If any of you have played FF14 and seen Dunskite, like, you've seen another iteration of her. She's also in, fate, in the Fate games. And so they ended up just sort of, like, swapping these two twins around in, like, where they were coming from. Interestingly, though, in Awakening... They ended up changing Lukta's name over to Larsa, just sort of as like an easier translation, and switched Skahawk, like sort of looked at that initial one and just said, we're just going to call him Ulster. <laughs> and so like, that's what his name ends up being in Awakening. But, and I think also in Cypher, too, he has a few, car well, he has a few cards where they're still going with that, but I'm not 100% sure. When they got to Heroes, however, they kept Larsa as a name and sort of like kept removing that, but they brought Skahawk back to his former glory of having his original name again. The reason for this is likely because when they were translating the locations of the Munster District, which is going to become more relevant when I start talking about Thracia, they changed one of the names of the locations there from Ulster to Ulster. And so in order to avoid confusion, they're like, all right, we know what this name is supposed to be. Uh, Shozokaga has left notes on what the name was supposed to be. We're going to go with that. And so we have his name back to where it should be. There is one exception, though, when I said to how most of the names don't really have a lot to do with things. And that is with Medir and Edain. Mo yeah, well, most of the genealogy na name schemes... Oh, no. This is really hard to use in gloves. Do you want to do oh, sure. So while most of the genealogy naming is skin deep, these two have a little bit more going on. And actually, like, a pretty cool way of, it, of going through it. So Medir on our right there is introduced in the prologue. He is one of the first units you get. And whoop, yep, there we go. And in chapter one, shortly after, you're introduced to Edain on the left. Both of them have extremely high love growths with each other, which for those of you who haven't played genealogy, each character in the first generation has a love score and love growths, both of which are used to sort of determine which characters end up together because their children are going to be the ones who take up the fight in the second half of the game. And so these two are sort of programmed to be like right in with each other from the beginning. The initial idea of the, yeah. The, other, the only two who also have like similar levels are Claude and Tailtu, who are the last two characters you get in Gen 1 and are... Basically, they have high love growth with everyone. They're just here to throw more people at your group to give them more, to give you more opportunities to make sure that you have, that you're passing on your traits and your skills for the second generation. These two, however, so you might think, like, why these two? And particularly, you have the mythological story of Medir and Edain, in which the Tuaha. Uh, Midir encounters a beautiful woman he falls in love with immediately named Idain, which is kind of a problem as Midir is already married. <laughs> so Midir's wife gets a fair bit jealous of Idain and transforms her into a butterfly before sending her off on an eternal storm of winds in order to keep her away from Midir for as long as she can manage. And she does manage it for a fair 300 years or so. Eventually, however, the butterfly falls into the wine glass of a queen where the queen drinks the butterfly 
and nine months later, uh, Idane is reborn as a human princess. Just before she was about to get just before she was about to get married, as she grows up to like, one of the kings of the four regions, Medir finally manages like, wait, hang on. Is that? Yes, it is. That's her. And, and arrives at the king's hall, asks for a single boon, and that boon is to embrace the princess once. He manages it, and when he does, all of Edain's memories come back. She remembers who she was in her previous life, and the two of them fly off together into the night. The High King was not particularly happy about this, and so from that day forward, it said that whenever he found a fairy mound, he would tear it up looking for, where, for whichever one Medir is in so he can kick his butt again. <laughs> but yes, as a result, these two, because like, they have that connection in the myth, end up having a solid pair, like one of the best pairings in Gen 1 for each other. They start strong, they stay strong, and if you'll give me one quick. That said, Idane, like the myth, having her other human husband, has a few more options. There's one or two other characters that, Medi that Idane works with, well with, oh, thank you, but Medir generally works Idane or nothing. After that, we move on to Thracia 776. Yes. Right. Woo. Woo. Where we start seeing more Irish mythology as the setting itself. The setting of Thracia is the Munster District, which gets talked about a little bit in genealogy, but here gets focused on hard. And it's made up of four kingdoms. Leinster, Munster, Connacht, and Ulster, or Ulster, depending on your translation, which happens to be the four counties of Ireland. <laughs> Just straight up. <laughs> it, and so you end up with Leif, the Prince of Leinster, who is forced to sort of fight back against the machinations of all of the villains from... Uh, yeah from genealogy. And he does this at the beginning through the Fianna and the Fianna Freeblades. Well, the Fianna Freeblades specifically. But where that name comes from is from the Fenian cycle. They're where that cycle gets its name from. Generally nomads, outlaws, and outsiders, and led by Finn McCool. And while in the game, they're led by Ival slash Bridget, we'll get to that, and Dagdar, Finn is the man, like, a man named Finn is the one who brings Leaf to the Free Blades in the first place. Now, in that last slide, I had talked a little bit about Ival and Br Bridget. And yep, yeah, feel click in the back. That's sort of where we get into the get into the concept of the Gish. So Bridget is one of the few characters in Sigurd's group who survives the Battle of Valhalla, the ending of part one to genealogy. But how? Her ending in genealogy is unclear. It just states that she is, her whereabouts are unknown. But we actually do get an answer to it in Thracia. We learn at the, during her ending in Thracia that she survived through the use of a gish, which all right, so what is one? A gish, or a gish, like spelled either in Gaelga or in English, is a promise which holds power. It's the idea that by holding to a spe spe yeah, specific belief or a specific restriction, that gives you power. Not holding to it, however, will do terrible things to you. And so you re like once you make a gish, you don't want to break it under any circumstances. Ival's Gaish was that she was no longer Bridget until seven years after the war had ended. And so by forswearing her identity for seven years after the war, she survives, she's able to survive the battle. 
And so because she keeps to that, she is able to be eventually in her ending reunited with her two children who are in your gen, or in your gen two for genealogy. Also, a few other, like, there wasn't really a lot more that I can put in here. Like, these were all little things that I found out that were neat. And that was that, well, Olwen and Linoan were, are both Welsh references rather than Irish. Lewin, which is with his very Welsh looking name, isn't Welsh. It was originally supposed to be translated as Levin, as in, a light, as in the Levin sword which is eventually why they changed it, because they didn't want it being confused with the two. Munir, one of the first bosses, was originally named Gandalf. <laughs> which, all right, no, fair play. He is a well-known dwarf in Norse mythology, but kind of got a little overshadowed there. Still kind of wish they kept it, because it would have been great. And lastly, Pern was originally designed, meant to be Pan, which sort of goes with his like chaotic, like thief aesthetic. And one last thing I kind of wanted to talk about for Thracia is Miranda. Just it, it was a little thing that I had noticed while I was setting this up that Miranda is the princess of Ulster, and yet she dresses like that all in green, white, and orange. Oh dear. The Republic of Ireland flag is a little controversial in Northern Ireland, which is where Ulster is. So, uh, yeah, let, let, let's, let's move away from the uncomfortable, po awkward, uncomfortable political arguments. Let's just move on to our next thing. Heck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't worry. Oh, oh, goodness, we are. All right. Yep. So, yep. Don't worry. I, I'm certain that we'll be completely and totally non biased through this entire <laughs> section. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's fine. All right. So there's a fair amount to talk about Three Houses in regards to Irish mythology. This was actually the first thing that I had wanted to work on with this. Like the Yggdraw games, there's a lot of cultural mixing going on with it. It is largely Irish mythology meets Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And so you're not going to have like as full like references that as like I would hope for in a full game, but you're still going to get a lot of influence in ways that I think are really neat. Particularly that each route seems to take inspiration from a different cycle. Right. That said, the first thing before anything else, we should talk about Fodlan. So in the mythological cycle, there are three, go there are three sovereignty goddesses. Eru, Bana, and Fodla. Eru is sort of where we get the etymological root of Ireland. Er's land, Ireland. The other two names for Bana and Fodla sort of became by, by names of Ireland. In the same way that you have like Albion for England, you have Fodla or Bana for Ireland. And so that's just sort of the biggest one. The, even within, there are several, there's so, there were too many to name, too many to count. Elil, Ferdiad, and Derdru are all names it, of cities, of places. The surrounding countries are all references in and of themselves. Just, this felt like the one where they went all in on Irish mythological theming. So I wanted to, con oh, yeah. all right. So starting off with Crimson Flower, like I said, totally not biased. <laughs> and its idea as the mythological cycle. Because yes, the, one of the primary themes of the mythological cycle was of humanity facing off against the gods in battle to control the world, for their control of the Isle of Destiny, or what became Ireland. The, those of the Tuatha that remained after, after the battle 
and after a lot of diplomacy, ended up going underground and turning into myths and fairies and gods. And here we end up with dragons instead, where we do end up killing Rhea. You don't necessarily have to with Sedith and Flame. They will go off on their own. They will hide away if you don't have to deal, uh, like if you don't actually kill them during, oh, I think it's chapter 14? I don't remember offhand. But in particular, the line that Edelgard has at the end, when humanity stands strong and people reach out for each other, there's no need for gods, is sort of like the byline of this storyline, but like also a little bit of the mythological cycle in that it is humanity sort of stepping up, taking our place in the world, and having the gods sort of move off into their own place and us taking our own. In particular, yep. Well, we have the Teltine Plains, which is both in-game, the site where Edelgard clashes with Dimitri and Rhea, but also the site where Rhea fought with Nemesis beforehand. The Teltine Plains are an actual place in Ireland. They are said to have been sanctified by Lou to honor the death of his foster mother, Teltu, who we talked a little bit back about back in genealogy. She was not entirely a reference back then, but here we start seeing it a little bit more. In at least one of the sources I'd found, although I have been trying to find more sources to corroborate this, they had found that, like they had mentioned that this is actually the place where the Milesians, the aged Irish, fought the Tuatha in, uh, the, Tuatha in the first place, which sort of gives a neat, uh, symmetry to what's going on there, and in particular, the fact that the Teltine Plains is only encountered in Crimson Flower. You don't really go there in any of the other routes. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're going to move on to our second one, Azure Moon, based on the Ulster cycle. So who would win? A fair-haired queen bent on domination or an angry boy with a spear? <laughs> <laughs> Guts was robbed. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of, like, Dimitri's got a lot of Cucullin DNA sort of kicking around in who he is as a person. Yep, so much rage. So much. <laughs> That's what they all say. But yes, so both primarily spear users, both pulled into adulthood at way too young an age. We both see in with Dimitri and losing his father early on, and Hugh Cullen sort of having an interesting childhood as well. He was originally an Imsitanta in the older myths before killing a dog that had belonged to the Smith Cullen. And as a result, he swore himself to the smith to be his new dog, which is where we get his name of Q, dog, and Cullen, the man that he had worked with. Mm. Yep. Talking for an hour is tough. Yeah. And in particular, another story I had mentioned earlier, uh, Tokmer Emer, or the wooing of Emer, mentions that Dimitri, or wow, not Dimitri, in this case, Kukulin had been sent off to fight, with the, to fight and train with the warrior Queen Skahawk at the age of 15 in order to more or less get him out of the hair of all of the other men in the place that he was at because they were worried that this 15-year-old was just too handsome for, out, like, for his own good. Like, all right, have you seen this guy? Have you seen what he's going to be in, like, a couple of years, we, we need him gone. Like no one, like no one is safe. Like no one's got a chance. We gotta get. Like l l let's have him go. Let's have him go to Scotland. It'll be great. That said, while he was in Scotland, 
He learned to wield a spear forged from the bones of a great beast. For Dimitri, it's Ariadbar, his dragon bone spear. But for Kikulin, it was Gabe, it was the original Gebolga, which was originally made from the bones of a sea serpent. Both of them have strong ties to Ferdiad. With Dimitri, you have like the ta- the city of Ferdiad, the, ca- the capital of the Holy Kingdom. And for the original Kukulin, he was while he was training with Skaha, he made friends and became battle brothers with another man named Ferdiad. And lastly, the rage. Oh dear, the rage. Kill every last one of them, the rage. Uh, not quite yet. The, with Dimitri, it's seen pretty early on in Azure Moon. Basically, gloves are off, eye is off, everything is off. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not an eight year old, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> With Kukulin, however, you get the warp spasm or the Reostrad, which was a form that he would take where his rage would consume him to the point that he would lose one eye just from one bulging out and the other shrinking back in. His bones would twist and shift. If you go back a slide to that pre- to the meme earlier, if you can see in the two pictures I had had there was sort of the beginning. The picture on the left hand side of Kikulin is the warp spasm starting to take hold. Right. So, next one. Uh, yes. That said, there is so, there is a fairly big difference in Azure Moon to the original ending of the Ulster Cycle. And that is that it actually does end on a relatively happy ending. None of the greater problems really end up getting resolved, but the core concept of we have our we have our main character that we are following. He is trying to defend his land from the fair-haired queen that's trying to take it over, and that he manages to see to succeed at by the end of the game. Everything else just sort of wraps back around to more of a satisfying game ending rather than like, yes, congratulations, you won. And now we're going to get to the death of Cucullin where he breaks one of those Gaiuses that he had taken on earlier. And we see here the statue of the dying Cucullin from Oliver Shepard, which depicts the final, his final moments where in battle, he had broken one of his gaiuses, he had lost most of his strength, and he had been told that he'll throw three spears and th- kill three kings in the process. And so, as he's fighting with the forces of Queen Maeve, he throws his first spear and accidentally kills one of the horses on his chariot, who was the king of horses. Again, he throws his spear, and this time he kills his charioteer, king of charioteers and with the third spear he hits himself and that he's not done just yet one of the the moment depicted here is that grievously wounded he took his belt takes his belts takes the guts that are currently out and just hauls them over a sand a standing stone so that he can stay standing and stay fighting until he, fi- until he dies standing up. So that would have been a cool metal ending, but we're, we're going to go from, <laughs> says the girl dressed as the one who kills him in the other timeline, but <laughs> would have been metal, but I understand the need for a happier ending to occur. Yeah. Lastly, we see Verdant Wind in the Fenian cycle, or we see the Fenian cycle in Verdant Wind. The Fenian cycle is sort of an odd duck compared to the other cycles, where the first two have a like a solid narrative that you can see one, two, three moving forward. You have the Fenian cycle, which is more loose, more episodic, more tied to the individual exploits of the individual heroes of the Fianna. 
Two themes tend to be prevalent in these stories, though. One of the outsider hero, and the other of the old seeding to the new. So the outsider hero, we can see in Claude a lot. Fianna tend to be, they're not tied to a specific kingdom, they're not tied to a specific place, they're tied more to each other than to anything else. They exist outside the system, whereas Cucullin existed more in the system. Throughout Verdant Wind, which I like, replayed beforehand for this, we see a lot of fuss being made about Claude's sort of status as an outsider in the king, like in Fodland. He's not, like, he talks about it a lot, other characters talk about it a lot. He is sort of building into that idea of the, of the outsider, that it's going to be a primary theme in these stories. In particular, you have Finn McCool. Also, this came up that in his youth, his name was Demna, which was Little Stag, which I thought was a very neat other little parallel and why you're sort of seeing the deer being a big aspect here. Yep. Nice. Yep. The other big aspect to this is the idea of the old seeding to the new. Much of the Fenian cycle gets ended up recounting by Ocean, who was the son of Finn McCool, to St. Patrick, who would be writing this down and making sure these n tales of older times and older religions were sort of being, pa like, sort of at least being preserved in some way. And so you see Rhea sort of step down at the end of uh, Verdant Wind. Like, Claude unites everything, but then goes off on his own, leaving Byleth to just be in charge and to sort of start a new age going in, going forward. Next. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> I would love to talk more about Silver Snow and the comparisons to King Cycle. Unfortunately, we never really got there. Silver Snow is, I don't want to say it's the most unfinished of the four, because, I mean, Crimson Flower exists, and it makes me sad that it has no cutscenes. <laughs> From doing nothing wrong, that's what I expect. <laughs> Getting better. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of it tends to just be, uh, we'll just grab some stuff over here from Verdant Wind and make it more and reapply it to being a new thing. So it's kind of tough to analyze on its own merits, given that it's just sort of either. So much of Verdant Wind got pulled from it to make theirs, or it got pulled from Verdant Wind. You kind of get a bit stranger on that. There is one big difference, though, between Verdant Wind and Silver Snow, and that is that Rhea is the final boss of Silver Snow. The primary feature of the King Cycle is the lineage of rulers, the idea of this person begat this person, who then begat this person, so on, so on, through the ages. And this is the, so, like, it is the one timeline where it is, Rhea is defeated by, by Byleth, who then takes over for her the, uh, fo the not foster child, uh, surrogate child, sort of taking the new place of the person before her. Mm -hmm. All right. So here I have some of the work cited. We got, I moved a little bit too quick in the beginning, unfortunately, but. We'll have time, we'll have time for comments. Yes, we'll have time for comments, questions. Plugs. Yes, plugs. <laughs> but yes, so we have, invaluable for a lot of the research here was the Corpus of Electronic Celt, uh, the Corpus of Electronic Texts, also known delightfully as Celt, it is, an, it is a database that Ireland manages of just all mythological texts and translating them from Old Irish into English. Also, ancienttexts.org helped me a lot with navigating Celt and getting a lot of the individual and having more links to stories that I can get to. 
as well as Bard Mythologies, which was another one that helped me with stories and summaries. And also, that is the one that I had found for the Teltin Plains being site. As for the Fire Emblem side of things, I had a lot of help from Serenus Forest, Fire Emblem Wiki, for cross-referencing, just giving me like sources for cross-referencing names, as well as the Choose Your Heroes, or Choose Your Legends contest in Heroes, which is giving me a lot of English translations for names. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's it. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. Mm -hmm. oh. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening to the panel. We do have some more time for uh, comments and questions. If you want to talk about your favorite Fire Emblem, something we might have missed or a little bit of tidbit, we could always do a 2.0 version of this in the future. In addition, uh, we aren't really traveling scholars or doing this for, t for cash in particular, but if you want to follow us on Twitch... <laughs> We are currently str uh, mainlining all of the mainline Final Fantasy games. We will switch over to Fire Emblem once we catch up with 16 or 17 by the time that we get done with all this. Uh, 14's a beast. But you can follow us on Twitch twitch.tv slash boss and bard. I am boss. She is bard. And this is, we always make boss and bard productions. Thank you, love. So, yeah, but yes, this is my actual wife. Well, very much. <laughs> Oh no! It's, it's fine, we'll get it later. Yes, so questions, comments, anyone? Yes? So this is a vocabulary question. You use the phrase mythological cycle. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? The question is. The question is, uh, to elaborate on the mythological cycle as a vocabulary term, one of the more... Pardon? Yeah, thank you. One of the more not convoluted, but one of the more confusing aspects of the mythology is that the first, the first cycle is called the mythological cycle. That's just the name of it. And that is where we see the Book of Invasions and Medir and Adain. That's just what that collection is called. They're called cycles on the whole, and all of them being mythological, I've yet to find a better like, name for them collectively, unfortunately. Yep. Right. Yes. When, when I saw the name Medir, it made me think of from Dark Souls 3, Dark mm. Medir. Is that just, oh, they just picked an Irish name, or is there some sort of maybe mythological connection between, like, Medir's story and, you know, Dark Eater Medir being, like, a dragon that ate the void and the void became part of the dragon? Um, most likely that was chosen as. Oh, yes. So the question was. D seeing Medir as a name, there's also Dark Eater Medir in Dark Souls 3, and if that's uh, connected, I would probably say not. There's not a lot in the story of Medir himself, like eating anything or becoming darkness through that. Like, the closest would be the queen that sort of ate the butterfly that would become Edain. It was most likely in the same vein as a lot of the stuff from genealogy, just pulled an Irish name that sounded cool. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, uh, Ethlyn, I think. Is that? Yep. Uh, pink hair in the back? Linoan! Linoan! <laughs> who is actually based on Rhiannon, uh, which I briefly touched on but didn't get a chance to. Uh... All right, your question? Um, most of the heroes... Oh, yes. So the question... Thank you. I'm <laughs> so glad you're here to help. The question was the Bo Ufel and its original translation and the entomology of that. I had looked into the holy weapons. They, didn't ha they all seemed to have more Norse referencing than Irish, with the exception of Gaebolga. And so I didn't research too much down that path. And the guy in black in the yep. back. Yep. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could repeat something you heard when you were going over the mythological cycle for Prince's flower, and you compare it to Elgar to one mythological figure, but I didn't name. Ah. Can you, like, which individual that was? Oh, yes
so the question was, I had talked about uh, Edelgard referencing a specific character in the mythological cycle, and she tends to be a mix of two, Ith being sort of the leader of the Milesians who led the invasion into Ireland to fight the gods in the first place, and Amorgan, who was their bard, who's sort of the one who's sort of seen as the like flagship person of that. Uh, yeah, purple. Um, I All right, I don't know if you were here earlier. The qu so the question... Oh, oh, okay. The Translation. yep, translations from genealogy into the current English translations that are particularly annoying to me. Like, I have a slide specifically of how much Aoife and Oife annoys me. The other one that immediately comes to mind was Sethleen in Three Houses, sort of as a different thing, is Kellen. Like, it's th a lot easier than they want it to be. Also but pronounced it, the way they pronounce the gods in mm -hmm. Three Houses. Yeah. I, that All right, uh, if you'll skip down to the names again so that I can take another mm. look. Like, which ones annoy me the most, though, is the question. <laughs> like, it's hard to compete with Oife for, like, my least favorite of them. Um, yeah, Renoan is another one that it's sort of like not quite Irish, but like just the mangling of Welsh is a bit on the annoying side. Um, yeah, I think they did pretty okay with Nisha, but like still kind of tough. Right, uh, orange. Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember his axe. Honestly, like, there are so many names that I usually just go with the heroes one because he is currently in heroes, and so I just default to that as it's the most modern English translation for a lot of them. Richard. All right, so the question was, do you, like, that Japanese games tend to, like, focus a little bit harder on Irish mythology and Celtic mythology as opposed to Greek or, or Norse? Generally, t probably just a more, you, like, more exotic, more out there myth that hasn't sort of, like, when you eventually go through, you can only see Norse and Greek so many times before, like, it's like, all right, okay, we've seen it again. But, like, it's still, like, Irish mythology still offers a bit more, like, off the beaten path while still being familiar. And so it sort of exists in a nice middle ground for that. Right, uh, Ella Wood, up in front. True that as well. That Irish mythology tends to have a little bit more like in common in terms of the gods' more hands-off nature and the more relationship with nature in general. Right. Any other questions? You there? Quite a lot. So the entirety of the Ulster cycle in general, which I only sort of glanced on here, is actually a war between Connacht and Ulster. And it's sort of starting from a feud with Queen Mabe, the queen of, of Connacht, and her husband, El uh, Elil, over which one of them brought more to their marriage. 
And so they would compare back and forth, back and forth. They would, and sort of like, well, I, I, I've got our castle. Well, I've got all, like all our money. Back and forth. They find themselves pretty evenly matched up until Elil mentions, well, I've got my cool bull over here. And Maeve just looks at him like, heck, I don't have that one. Uh, all right, uh, guards. Up in Ulster, there's, a, there's a, the brown bull of Cooley. He's like the best bull. Go up there, do some diplomacy, get, a, like, get me to just have that bull for like a week so I can win this contest, and then we can like, send him back. She sends the guards up there. They end up getting drunk and saying, well, like, of course they're going to give us the bull. I mean, if we don't, we're, like, we're Connacht. We're the strongest army in Ireland. We'll just come in and invade them. And the guards in Ulster hear this and say, bring it then. And this is where most of the Ulster cycle is taking place with these two uh, counties just at war with each other. <laughs> All right, uh, in the middle? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned St. Patrick. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the bulk of Irish mythology. Um, I'm assuming that it's like It's uh, so the question was a fire emblem man having more of the pre Christian or post Christian Irish mythology. The problem with that is we only really have the post Christian Irish mythology, we don't have any written records of the because Ireland was Christianized in like the fourth century and was able to get a lot of its writing done through that, and so Christian monks were our primary source for a lot of these old myths. Right. Yes, you there. Um, so I've been replaying Shadow Dragon, and uh, one thing that stands out to me is like, and this is a theme I've played in some of the other prior games, is like weapons of old or like artifacts of old being used again anew to like defeat a new enemy <laughs> or a resurrected new enemy. <laughs> is that a thing that it exists in like Irish mythology, like connecting to like an ancient warrior's weapon or? Mm -hmm. Alright, so the question was do mythological like, do the mythological sources have weapons that are sort of passed down like old weapons to face new threats? Gabe Olga tends to be the closest you can occasionally see with Cleave Solish or with Luz Spear. There are some but they don't come up a lot. Like, they're very rarely a thing. So, what? we had like, one more question. All right, so, we should probably clear out. All right, all right, one more question. Um, you there? Right. Outside of myths or legends or stories that you know, conveyed as part of this panel, you know, mm -hmm. outside of relation to Fire Emblem, what's your favorite Irish or Celtic myth that you would love to see adapted in some way? Ooh. So the question was, what was my favorite Irish myth that I'd like to see adapted? I cut, my first instinct is the wooing of Ymir, partially because you've got cool Cucullin action and like him having his training montage in Dunskite and all of that, but also because during research I had to read 20 paragraphs of Cucullin explaining to his charioteer. It's like, all right, so that guy in there, Forgal, uh, Ymir's dad, he, he, his father is so-and-so, whose father is so-and-so beyond that, going on for 20 pages, or 20 paragraphs, up until he, it's like, and that guy was a Fovera, which means that we gotta kick his ass. <laughs> and it's like, all right, really wish that was a bit shortened, but I love how long that took, and I want to see that adapted. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. The, the turnout's been outstanding. Thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it.